60 Minutes Rewind. It's not often you get the chance to meet a man who holds a place in history like Ben Ferenz. He's 97 years old, barely five feet tall, and he served as prosecutor of what's been called the biggest murder trial ever. The courtroom was Nuremberg. The crime, genocide. The defendants, a group of German SS officers accused of committing the largest number of Nazi killings outside the concentration camps. More than a million men, women, and children shot down in their own towns and villages in cold blood. Ferenz is the last Nuremberg prosecutor alive today. But he isn't content just to be part of 20th century history. He believes he has something important to offer the world right now. You know, you have seen the ugliest side of humanity. Yes. You've really seen evil. And look at you. You're the sunniest man I've ever met. <laughs> the most you, optimistic. You want to get some more friends? <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is nice. Watching Ben Ferenz during his daily swim. All right. His gym well, workout. I'm showing off now. And his morning push-up regimen. 100. Is to realize he isn't just the sunniest man we've ever met. He may also be the fittest. Oh, he's dead. And that's just the beginning. The case we present is a plea of humanity to law. This is Ferenz making his opening statement in the Nuremberg courtroom 70 years ago. The charges we have brought accuse the defendants of having committed crimes against humanity. The Nuremberg trials after World War II were historic, the first international war crimes tribunals ever held. Hitler's top lieutenants were prosecuted first. Then a series of subsequent trials were mounted against other Nazi leaders, including 22 SS officers responsible for killing more than a million people, not in concentration camps, but in towns and villages across Eastern Europe. They would never have been brought to justice were it not for Ben Ferenz. He looks so young. I was so young. <laughs> I was 27 years old. Had you prosecuted trials before? Never in my life. Come I don't recall if I'd ever been in a courtroom, actually. Ferenz had immigrated to the U.S. as a baby, the son of poor Jewish parents from a small town in Romania. He grew up in a tough New York City neighborhood where his father found work as a janitor. When I was taking the school at the age of seven, I couldn't speak English. I spoke Yiddish at home, and I was very small, and so they wouldn't let me in. So you didn't speak English till you were eight? That's correct. Could you read? No, on the contrary. The silent movies always had writing on it. And I would ask my father, Vazuktis, in, in Yiddish, what does it say? What does it say? He couldn't read it either. <laughs> <laughs> but Ferenz learned quickly. He became the first in his family to go to college, then got a scholarship to Harvard Law School. But during his first semester, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, and he, like many classmates, raced to enlist. He wanted to be a pilot but the Army Air Corps wouldn't take him. And they said, no, you're too short. Your legs won't reach the pedals. The Marines, they just looked at me and said, forget it, kid. <laughs> so he finished at Harvard, then enlisted as a private in the Army. Part of an artillery battalion, he landed on the beach at Normandy and fought in the Battle of the Bulge. Toward the end of the war, because of his legal training, he was transferred to a brand new unit in General Patton's Third Army created to investigate war crimes. As U.S. forces liberated concentration camps, his job was to rush in and gather evidence. Ferenz told us he is still haunted by the things he saw and the stories he heard in those camps. A father who, his son told me the story, his father had died just as we were entering the camp. And the father had routinely saved a piece of his bread for his son and he kept it under his arm at night. Mm. He kept it under his arm at night so the other inmates wouldn't steal it, you know? So you see these human stories which are not, they're not real, they're not real, but they were real. Ferenz came home, married his childhood sweetheart, and vowed never to set foot in Germany again. But that didn't last long. 
General Telford Taylor, in charge of the Nuremberg trials, asked him to direct a team of researchers in Berlin, one of whom found a cache of top secret documents in the ruins of the German Foreign Ministry. He gave me a bunch of uh, binders, four binders, and these were daily reports from the Eastern Front. Which unit entered which town, how many people they killed, it's classified, so many Jews, so many gypsies, so many others. Ferenz had stumbled upon reports sent back to headquarters by secret SS units called Einsatzgruppen, or action groups. Their job had been to follow the German army as it invaded the Soviet Union in 1941 and kill communists, gypsies, and especially Jews. There were 3,000 SS officers trained for the purpose and directed to kill without pity or remorse every single Jewish man, woman, and child they could lay their hands on. So they went that right in after their the assignment. troops. Come up behind the troop, round up the Jews, kill them all. Only one piece of film is known to exist of the Einsatzgruppen at work. It isn't easy to watch. Well, this is a typical operation. Well, let's see uh, here. This, they rounded them up. They all have already tags on them. And they're chasing they're them. They're making them run to their own death? Yes. There was a rabbi coming along there. Just put them in the ditch, shoot them there. Oh, See, my God. Oh, my God. Yeah. This footage came to light years later. At the time, Ferenz just had the documents, and he started adding up the numbers. When I reached over a million people murdered that way, over a million people, it's more people than you've ever seen in your life. I took a sample, I got on the next plane, flew from Berlin down to Nuremberg, and I said to Taylor, General, we've got to put on a new trial. But the trials were already underway, and prosecution staff was stretched thin. Taylor told Ferenz adding another trial was impossible. And I started screaming. I said, look, I got here mass murder, mass murder on, on parallel scale. And he said, can you do this in addition to your other work? And I said, sure. He said, OK, so you do it. And that's how 27-year-old Ben Ferenz became the chief prosecutor of 22 Einsatzgruppen commanders at trial number nine at Nuremberg. How do you plead to this indictment? Guilty or not guilty? Nicht schuldig. Standard routine. Nicht schuldig, not guilty. Guilty or not guilty? Nicht schuldig. They all say not guilty. Same thing, not guilty. But Ferenz knew they were guilty and could prove it. Without calling a single witness, he entered into evidence the defendants' own reports of what they had done. Exhibit 111. In the last 10 weeks, we have liquidated around 55,000 Jews. Exhibit 179 from Kiev in 1941. The Jews of the city were ordered to present themselves. About 34,000 reported, including women and children. After they had been made to give up their clothing and valuables, all of them were killed, which took several days. Exhibit 84 from Einsatzgruppen D in March of 1942, total number executed so far, 91,678. Einsatzgruppen D was the unit of Ferenz lead defendant Otto Ohlendorf. He didn't deny the killings, he had the gall to claim they were done in self-defense. He was not ashamed of that. He was proud of that. He was carrying out his government's instructions. How did you not hit him? There was only one time I wanted to hit him, really. One of these, my defendants, he gets up and he says, was, Juden erschossen, das höre ich hier zum ersten Mal, which is, what, the Jews were shot? I hear it here for the first time. Boy, I felt if I'd had a bayonet, I would have jumped over the thing and put a bayonet right through one ear and let it come out the other. You know? Yeah. You know? That <laughs> son of and a you bitch. Had his name and down I've, on got, piece of... I've got his reports of how many he killed. You know? I'm an innocent so lamb. Did you look at the defendant's faces? Defendant's face were blank all the time. Defendant's absolutely blank. They could like this. They're waiting, they're waiting for a bus. What was going on inside of you? Of me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still churning. To this minute. Uh, I'm still churning. All 22 defendants were found guilty, and four of them, including Ohlendorf, were hanged. 
Ferenc says his goal from the beginning was to affirm the rule of law and deter similar crimes from ever being committed again. Did you meet a lot of people who perpetrated war crimes who would otherwise, in your opinion, have been just a normal, upstanding citizen? Of course, is my answer. These men would never have been murderers had it not been for the war. These were people who could quote Goethe, who loved Wagner, who were polite. What turns a man into a savage beast like that? He's not a savage. He's an intelligent, patriotic He's a savage being. when he does the murder, though. No, he's a, a patriotic human being acting in the interest of his country in his mind. You don't think they turn into savages even for the act? Do you think the man who dropped a nuclear bomb on Hiroshima was a savage? Now I will tell you something very profound, which I have learned after many years. War makes murderers out of otherwise decent people. All wars and all decent people. The story will continue after this. So Ferenc has spent the rest of his life trying to deter war and war crimes by establishing an international court like Nuremberg. He scored a victory when the International Criminal Court in The Hague was created in 1998. May it please your honors. He delivered the closing argument moment. in the court's first case. Now, you've been at this for 50 years, if not more. We've had genocide since yes. then in going Cambodia. Going on right this minute. Going yes. on right this minute in yes. Sudan. We've had Rwanda. We've had Bosnia. You're not getting very far. Well, don't say that. People get discouraged. They should remember from me, it takes courage not to be discouraged. Did anybody ever say that you're naive? Of course. <laughs> Some Are people say I'm crazy. Here? Well, if it's naive to want peace instead of war, let it make sure they say I'm naive, because I want peace instead of war. If they tell me they want war instead of peace, I don't say they're naive. I say they're stupid. Stupid to an incredible degree to send young people out to kill other young people they don't even know, who never did anybody any harm, never harmed them. That is the current system. I am naive? That's insane. Thank, thank you very much. Ferenc is legendary in the world of international law, and he's still at it. Are you going to help me save the world? I heard so. Uh, it's up to you. Up he to never you. stops pushing his message. War, not war. Never give up. Never give up. And he's donating his life savings to a genocide prevention initiative at the Holocaust Museum. He says he's grateful for the life he's lived in this country and it's his turn to give back. You are such an idealist. I don't think I'm an idealist, I'm a realist. And I see the progress, the progress has been remarkable. Look at the emancipation of women in my lifetime. You're sitting here as a female. Look what's happened to the same-sex marriages. If to tell somebody a man can become a woman, a woman can become a man, and a man can marry a man, they would have said, you're crazy. <laughs> uh, but it's a reality today. So the world is changing and you shouldn't, you know, be despairing because it's never happened before. Nothing new ever happened before. Ben, but we're on a roll. I we're marching forward. Ben, I'm sitting here listening to you, and you're very wise, and you're full of energy and passion, and I can't believe you're 97 years old. <laughs> well, I'm still a young man. Clearly. <laughs> and clearly. I'm still in there fighting. <laughs> and you know what keeps me going? I know I'm right. <laughs>